Hello chess fans. Today I have an exciting smashing attack from Viswanathan Anand in a Sicilian defense against Ivan Sokolov in a rapid tournament in 1992. Anand of course has always been famous for his very quick and intuitive play and in this game those skills are on full display. The game opens with pawn to e4 and we get a Sicilian defense. Certainly something that we've seen a lot of in the brilliant games we've been looking at. As early as move six, we get a, what I think is a probably an innovation, the move a4. Now, in my database, this has been played 50 times, but this is 30 years later. Databases are a lot larger. I suspect that this is probably something Anand just picked in the spur of a moment in a rapid tournament. I don't think we are really dealing with preparation here from either player from this point onward in this rapid tournament. And... Computer analysis suggests that that's, you know, likely to be true given that the players don't play what is considered the most precise moves according to the computer. And moves like g3 here suggest that the players are just trying to get to a normal position, play chess, and then see what happens, which is good rapid strategy even if it's not the most incisive. For an example, uh, in this position, the move g4 instead of g3 would have been an interesting and incisive alternative if Anand wanted to kind of spice things up a little bit already this early in the game. Now, after black castles, uh, bishop g2, queen c7, and bishop e3, I think we already have a critical moment in the game. Black has played the knights here and here. Now, this is good for targeting e4, uh, and if black could play pawn to b6 and bishop b7, there'd be good pressure on e4 that would tie white down a little bit. But it's very difficult to achieve this. The fact that the bishop is on g2 means that at the moment, e4 is very secure, and pushing the pawn usually walks into e5. So it's difficult to increase the pressure on e4, and to find some good squares for your pieces. At this point, I think Sokolov needs a new plan, and it's not easy to come up with one, and he doesn't manage to do it in the game. I'd encourage you to pause your videos and try to figure out what is a nice reorganizing maneuver he could have made to have gotten a good position at this point in the game and gotten some counterplay. So, the suggestion from Stockfish, and this is totally Stockfish, of course, is the very nice and instructive move knight c to d7. Retreating the knight to d7 opens up the queen on the c file. That's one limitation of having the knight be on c5, and the knight is now headed to c4. So it can go to e5 or b6, onward to c4, and c4 is going to be a great square for that knight. It's going to be very hard to evict the knight from c4, and it's going to tap at the bishop on e3 and the pawn on uh, b2. Coming moves like bishop d7 and then rook c8, I think give black a totally fine position. Um, this is really the way to play. Instead, Sokolov plays the move rook b8, which I think is an important inaccuracy. It seems clear that the idea is to push b6, play bishop b7, get the rook off the long diagonal to do these things. But after the move f4, it turns out that Sokolov can't play this way. So at least, if nothing else, rook b8 seems to be a wasted move. If b6, the very nice move, pawn to e5, kind of punches right into the black position. And capturing on e5 leads to another capture on e5. The pawn can't be picked up because the rook on b8 proves to be tactically vulnerable. It gets hit by the skewer. And if the knight retreats at this point, simply knight c6 creates a theme that I think you should be familiar with in many Sicilians. If you play the Sicilian, the rook is hit and anywhere it goes, there's knight takes e7, and this bishop can pick off the rook white wins at least an exchange and has an excellent position from here on out. So, realizing that he can't play the move pawn to b6, Sokolov plays the move rook to e8. Now, this recalls a very famous game, Kasparov playing black against Karpov in the 1985-1985 World Championship match. Um, but this move is actually a tactical blunder, and it lacks the zing that uh, rookie eight had in that game between Kasparov and Karpov. So this is a good point to pause your video and figure out how Anand should play. 
It turns out that once again, like we've already seen, the move e5 is an excellent move. Now, black would kind of like to not capture this and avoid opening the rook on the f file, but if the knight moves, well, if it goes here, we simply capture, we're winning a pawn and maintaining a big attack, and if it retreats here, capturing on d6 is very good for two different tactical reasons. First, there's bishop takes d6 when knight to b5 hits the queen and the bishop. Yes, the knight can be captured, but it simply gets replaced. d6 is going to fall, white's going to have an extra pawn and a brilliant position in general. And if queen takes d6 to avoid this knight b5 tactic, there's a different tactic. Pawn to b4 simply picks off this knight on c5. So, after e5, Sokolov did choose to capture on e5. Of course, we take back and open the f file, and now he played the move knight c to d7, or knight f to d7. This is a good point to pause your video again and ask yourself, how did Anand play in this position? So, I'm, I'm going to assume that everyone found the right solution, but I would kind of wonder if everyone found it as quickly as Anand did. Of course, I don't have the time records from the game, but he's famous for his quick and incisive calculation, and I have to think he probably didn't take more than a few seconds to pick his move in this position. It's worth pointing out that b4, which already came up in the previous variation, is also good here. And again, we could just trap the knight, and we should be able to win the game, maybe black, can you know capture on e5, capture back on c5, try to muddy the position a little bit, but b4 wins a piece and should win the game. However, Anand found a very nice blow here. Rook takes f7. This is a great tactic, one you should be familiar with if you've never seen it before. Take some extra time to process it because this kind of tactic does come up in similar positions fairly often. Now, you cannot capture the rook. If you're interested in that, you can look at the variations in my notes. But of course, the natural thing to do and the only really thing, only thing you can really do that's going to give you fighting chances is try to take the rook. Now queen h5 check. And here's the problem. The rook on e8 has lined up with the king on f7. This is again, kind of a common theme. If the rook is on e8 and the f file opens, there's a fair number of games where you see this rook takes f7 idea or maybe some other pieces sacrificed on f7 and then queen h5 check creates a big problem. Now g6 just gets mated in two moves. So game over, no need to analyze further right there. And uh, king g8 of course drops the rook. That's not the entire story. If you're interested in seeing how white could really incisively finish after that, uh, check the notes. But king f8 seems like the most natural move does defend the rook here. Now, rook f1 check is going to force black to block. So you can throw a piece in the way here on f6, which black does. That piece is captured, black recaptures. And at this point, black has managed to give back a little bit of material. So in terms of raw material count, black's not doing so bad, right? Um, because white sacrificed a whole rook, black is still theoretically up a little bit of material. White now needs another hammer blow to kind of finish off the position. And again, I'd ask you to pause your video and try and figure out what you would play. So there are multiple solutions here. Uh, and in fact, the one Anand picked is not even my favorite, although it is equally winning and just also brilliant. Knight c6 is my favorite move, pointed out by Stockfish. Very nice idea to interfere with the defense of c5 by the queen. Of course, if the knight is captured, then c5 is captured and white's attack is crushing. But otherwise, the rook on b8 is under attack and moving it still doesn't defend the knight on c5. So knight c6 is a crushing move. However, Anand picked a slightly different move. He picked knight db5, which opens up an attack from the bishop on c5. And the queen is also cooperating, so c5 is going to fall and when it does, the attack on the diagonal is going to overwhelm the black king who's already on under attack on the f file and from the queen kind of over here. So 
The knight is captured, and this is kind of interesting. At this point, Anand plays a winning move, but bishop takes c5 was immediately there. He didn't need to throw in knight takes b5 first, but he did, and this is also winning. And again, it's rapid chess, so expecting uh, the 100% correct moves every single move is kind of unreasonable. So the queen now needs to move. It's worth pointing out that if the queen offers a queen trade and tries to get into uh, this line to defend the rook on e8, then white can simply take here, and after king moves, queen takes, king takes, knight d6, check is a winning position. Uh, at this point, white is still down the exchange. So if, for example, king f8 and white captured here, white's endgame should be winning, but he's actually only a pawn up. The problem, though, is that whenever the king moves to defend the rook on e8, white actually wins a whole piece over here, which is, of course, plenty of material, um, but could resign in good fate after knight d6 check. So instead, Sokolov puts the queen on d7, and now queen takes h7 is a very nice move, not even capturing on c5. Still, Anand takes a moment and just prepares a devastating threat of rook takes f6, pawn takes bishop h6, and it's going to be checkmate. So Sokolov tries to defend f6 and c5 in the same move. And again, it's another great moment to pause your video and ask yourself, what did Anand play? So it turns out that defending f6 did not defend f6. Rook takes f6 is a really beautiful blow. This is just sacrifice after sacrifice from Anand. Uh, he's just throwing the pieces around the board. Uh, but he clearly has enough material to finish off the attack. Of course, again, if g takes, bishop h6 simply leads to mate, queen blocks, and we take, and it's checkmate. So after rook takes f6, queen takes, bishop takes c5 check, rook to e7, queen h8 check, king up, knight d6, and at this point, Sokolov chose to resign. Uh, it's move 26 which is technically one move longer than most people consider a miniature. Most people say a miniature is 25 moves, but it certainly has that crackle and pop feel that a miniature has. It seems like a miniature to me featuring such beautiful and incisive play from Anand. At this point, the only move is king up to g6, and the reason Sokolov resigned is after bishop check. You know, there's really no point blocking. You're just losing the queen and still losing the game. King up. Queen h4 is checkmate. Of course, there are other ways to play, <laughs> but this is the most direct and uh, maybe the most beautiful checkmating option available to white. So I hope you like this video. It's really fun to see these kind of uh, sacrificial attacks. It's also very instructive. You know, these kind of ideas certainly come up in your own Sicilian game, so you should be intimately familiar with these kinds of rook takes f7, uh, pawn e5, uh, demolitions in the Sicilian defense. There have certainly been hundreds in chess history. If you like the video, be sure to subscribe on YouTube and hit the bell to be notified of new videos. Also, nothing would be nicer than a comment letting us know your thoughts on the video and some ideas for future videos. Thank you so much and have a great day.